This video is about decision analysis, and decision analysis is really um, just a convenient way. It's a framework where we can organize the considerations that go into making a decision. It's a good idea to use decision analysis when you're making a big decision like these that I put here. Um, we see that CVS Health is buying Aetna for $69 billion. This is a very big decision, probably not gone about in a hasty way. Um, and, you know, this other headline says that iPhone chip supplier Dialog is planning for several scenarios after admitting Apple could bring design in-house. Okay, so looking at several scenarios, um, by the end of this lesson, you probably have a good idea of what they are actually doing when they do that. So this this lesson is going to be about uh, chapter 20, about decision making, specifically decision analysis. And as I said, it's really just a framework. It's a it's a way of putting all of the considerations that will go into a decision into a couple of tables and a couple of metrics that will help you identify what would be the best decision considering your various priorities. Okay, so. Um, there are really um, four steps, and I'm going to go through these one by one um, with an example. Um, in every decision, we're trying to decide between a set of alternative um, a set of alternative courses of action. So these are things that we have control over. That is, which one of these courses of action should we take? So that's what we can control. Now, the other element that we have to consider is, well, what don't we have control over? So we have certain uncertain events, and these are called states of nature. These are things that are beyond our control, and we just have to imagine, well, what would happen if this particular thing happened, or what would happen if this would happen? Um, what is the interaction between our course of action and our you know, certain states of nature, okay? Um, then we have to determine, okay, considering those courses of action and those uncertain events, what will be the payoff of different courses of action? And then we have to adopt a decision criteria, and there are going to be four of them that we'll look at. Um, so given that we've, we've put everything together and we've determined what our payoffs and opportunity losses would be, um, we're not quite done yet because we have to determine, well, what, you know, now that we have all the information together, what decision criteria do we use to finally come to a decision? Okay. So the first thing we want to do is to create what's called a payoff table. And the payoff table looks like this. We put our courses of action as columns just across the top. We see here that um, we have the option of building a large factory. We have, you know, the other option is an average size factory, or we could build a small one. Okay. And down here for each row, we have one of these states of nature. Okay. So again, these are the things we don't have any control over, and we just want to plan for these possibilities. So if there is a strong economy, we see that uh, if we have built a large factory, we have quite a large payout, quite a large payoff, you know, the largest one in the table, actually. Um, on the other hand, if we have built a small factory and there's a strong economy, then we have missed out on certain opportunities. And so we have a, you know, we still have a payoff, but not a very large one. Um, so on the other hand, you see if there's a weak economy, and we have built a large factory, then we have invested too much, um, probably slow down in production, a lot of waste, and so we wind up with a negative payoff. But on the other hand, if there's a weak economy and we've had a small factory, then you know this is still not a very large payoff, but at least it's positive. So you see that if there's a weak economy, uh, it would have been the best choice to make a small factory. But if there was a strong economy, our best choice would have been large factory. Okay. So let's go ahead and put together a payoff table for this decision case. You are an energy company that's considering three possible locations for natural gas drilling. We've got Alaska, Bahrain, 
and California, so A, B, and C. Um, because of the different setup costs, permit costs, and shipping costs, profit will vary according to the size of what you find. And those will be our uncertainties, okay, our unknowns. Um, so if we find a small deposit, our profits will be like this. So, so in Alaska, the payoff would be 200, um, and, and in Bahrain, 150. So let's go ahead and start you know, putting this together. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this is a, this is my payoff table, okay? And um, so across the top, these will be my courses of action. So it'd be Alaska, Bahrain, or California. And across here, well, you know, this is going to be the size of the find after we drill. So it could either be small or medium or large. Okay. And so let's see. If it's a small deposit, Alaska is going to be uh, 200, Bahrain 150, California 100. Okay, if it's medium, it's going to be 180 and 300, whoops, 300, and for California, 100. For a large deposit, we're going to have 105, 150, and 380. Okay, so if we just kind of glance at this, we can see that the best the best possible outcome comes if we have decided to drill in California and we find a large deposit. Uh, however, if we have decided to drill in California and there's a small deposit, then we have gotten less than we would have gotten if we had chosen Alaska, okay, or, or even Bahrain. So, if we find a large one, it turns out that California was the best choice, but if we find a small one, it looks like Alaska is the best choice. Okay, so this is our first step. Um, uh, we kind of can visualize the interaction between the choices we control and the states of nature that we don't control. Okay? So the next thing we have to do is try to um, get a sense of the intuition that comes along with um, what we have missed out on by making the wrong choice. So for example, let's say we find a small deposit. You got, um, uh, so the best choice in that scenario would have been Alaska. So we would have gotten 200. But in Bahrain, so if we had chosen Bahrain, how much did we miss out on? Well, it would have been the difference between that 200 and the 150 in Bahrain. So we missed out on 50. On the other hand, in California, if we had chosen California, then we have missed out on 100. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate each of those and we'll call those our opportunity loss. Call it our opportunity loss table. And I'm going to just take the same table and I'll get rid of these. Okay, so basically the way to calculate the opportunity loss for each decision is to say, well, what is the maximum payoff in this row? And then subtract whatever is in this cell here. Okay, so I'll do this with a couple of functions, Excel functions I'll do. Okay, so give me the max of this row and then subtract what was in this Alaska. Okay. Now in this case it's going to be zero and that's because there is no opportunity lost because Alaska was the best decision in this case. So we'll do the same thing over here. Um, so once again we want the max of all of these and we know it's 200 but let's go ahead and make it flexible. Okay. And so once again max of these three subtracting out what is here. Okay, so we see that um, we can see what the damage is by making the incorrect choice for a state of nature. So if there's a small one, Alaska, we've missed out on nothing. Bahrain, we missed out on 50. California, we missed out on 100. Okay, let's go ahead and fill in 
this next row. So this time it's going to be the maximum here, which should be 300, minus what's in here. Okay, so we missed out on 120 there. Maximum here again, minus what's in there. And max of here, minus what's in there. <clears throat> okay, and finally this row, max of these three, which is 380. What's the opportunity loss for Alaska? Maximum of these three minus what we would get in Bahrain. And again, max of these. Whoops. Max of these minus what's in here. Okay, so there should be a zero in each row. In the in the choice that um, would have been the the best decision for that. Now it just so happens that in our example, uh, we um, for each choice, if, for each state of nature, it turns out that the optimal choice was a different a different um, drilling location. It isn't always like that. Um, uh, it's just that's that's how our that's how our example turned out. Okay, so um, now at this point we we have a couple of things that we can do. We we have to decide what is going to be our decision criteria. We're going to convert these tables here, which you know are informative, but they're not a decision, um, into decisions by determining well what is our what is our decision criteria. Okay. And we're going to talk about four, two of which we can calculate right away, um, and two of which we're going to need a little bit more, a little bit more information in this table. Okay, um, so we have a decision criterion, which tells us, okay, uh, let's just go for whatever choice is going to give us the maximum payoff. So we just look in this whole table here and say where's the biggest number? Okay. So technically what we're doing is we're going across each row and we're saying okay what's the maximum there? What's the maximum there? What's the maximum there? And then what is the maximum of those maximums? So this decision criteria is called the maxi max. Okay. Maximum of the maximums. It's going to be the same uh, whether we do it that way or we just say, well, what's the biggest number in here? And we see the biggest number is 380. Okay, so under the um, maxi max decision criteria, the decision then would be to drill in California. Okay, and that's because that is the maximum of the maximums. Okay, so this would be. The, the maxi max is is the confident option okay so we we want to take the optimistic approach and just go for the largest possible return okay now likewise um, you know the opposite of confident is you know not confident or you know pessimistic where we might want to just say well let's figure out um, what is the best of the worst case scenarios so, for example, if there is a small, okay, what is the um, uh, what's the minimum uh, what's the minimum payoff here if there is a small? So the worst case scenario here for small is 100, and the worst case scenario here is 100, and the worst case scenario here is 105. Okay, so once again we go row by row, except this time we're looking at the minimums. Okay, so the minimum there is 100, minimum there is 100, and minimum there is 105. Okay, so we've got three of them. So let's just let's just jot it down so we don't forget. Minimum there is 100, minimum there is 100, and minimum there is 105. Okay, so now what we want to do is say, well, so which of these is the which of these is the largest of the minimums? Okay, so we'll call this the maxi min. Okay, so the maximum minimum. And in this case it's 105, which is the um, uh, 
okay, which is the Alaska. Okay, so that tells us that Alaska is going to be a good choice. Okay, so as you can see, what what will happen here is um, if if there is a um, for each of the worst possible outcomes here. So if we if we just imagine what is the worst that could happen under a small, what's the worst that can happen under a medium, what's the worst that can happen under a large, and then we just choose the choice that corresponds to the best of those worst. Okay, so we're really trying to make the best of a bad situation here. So in this case, it tells us under that decision criteria, we are going to pick Alaska. Okay, so um, we've gotten a little bit closer, but we still have some uncertainty about what's going to be the best course of action because two different criteria give us two different answers. Okay, well, let's say that we, we know a little bit more than what we have here. Let's say we actually have some information on what is the probability of each of these states of nature. And let's just say that it's, um, it's a, there is a 25% chance of finding a small deposit, 50% chance of finding a medium, and a 25% chance of a large. Okay, so now we actually can incorporate these probabilities into coming up with um, the expected value of a particular choice. Okay, so the expected value. So we want to know for each choice what's going to be the expected value given what the probability of, of each of these potential outcomes is. So how do we calculate that? Well, when we want to find the expected value of a discrete probability distribution, what we do is we multiply the outcome times the probability of that outcome for each of the outcomes, and then we add them all up. So for example, this, this table here shows you the number of computer interruptions in a single day and the probability of that number of computer interruptions. And this, you know, this might be gathered from historical data, and you would say, well, how many can I plan for? How many should I plan for? And it turns out that all you have to do is just multiply this times this plus this times this plus this times this. So in this column, we see they're multiplying the value of the x random variable, which is in this column, times the probability of that value. And then we just add them all up. <clears throat> and that gives us 1.4. So in this case, we can plan for 1.4 computer interruptions per day. Okay, so we can use this same idea to assign an expectation to the value of each choice. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing where we multiply the payoff times the probability of that payoff, and then we're going to add them all up. So each choice is going to have an expected value. Okay, so let's, I'm going to do the first couple of them uh, just multiplying it one at a time, and then I'll then I'll use a shortcut function for it. <clears throat> okay, so this is going to be payoff times the probability of that payoff plus this payoff times the probability of that payoff plus this payoff times the probability of that payoff. Okay. All right, so as you can see, this is something like a weighted average for all the different possible outcomes from an Alaska decision. Okay, we'll do the same thing here. So outcome times probability plus outcome times probability plus outcome times probability. Okay, and okay, I'll do it manually one more time here. So this will be outcome times probability plus outcome times probability plus outcome times probability. Okay, so this is going to be called the expected monetary value. And we could make a decision criterion, which is just we want the one with the highest expected monetary value. So EMV, expected monetary value. Okay, 
And so in this case, you know, this is, we can see that the Bahrain actually has the highest expected monetary value. Okay, um, so Bahrain. <clears throat> okay, now similar similar to the expected value, you know, once again we have these probabilities of these outcomes that we put over here, and now we would want to know the expected opportunity lost, right? So now we do the same thing where we're multiplying this times this and adding this times this. And so um, um, I'm going to use a, you know, this kind of adding products occurs so often in Excel that there's a function for it, which is called sum product, sum product. So I want to take these, you know, each of these multiplied by each of these and then add them all up. Okay. So take the take the products, you know, this times this plus this times this plus this times this. Same as before. This just gives us a nice little shortcut. Okay. So this is going to be um, some product of these and these. And this will be the sum product of these and these, okay? So in this case, now, we're not going to be looking for the maximum, right? Because we don't want the maximum opportunity loss. What we want is the minimum opportunity loss. And it looks like, in this case, Bahrain gives us the lowest expected opportunity cost. And the, the result that you get from finding the minimum expected opportunity loss and you know, the, the decision that you come to from the expected value, the maximum. So whether you come at the decision from getting the maximum expected value or the minimum expected opportunity loss, it should be the same result. And it is. In both cases, we chose Bahrain. Okay? So here we see the, the evidence is mounting um, that uh, although, although California provides a very nice maximum, Alaska provides a you know, pretty good safe, uh, a safe decision, that when you consider the probabilities of each of these outcomes, it turns out that um, Bahrain actually looks like the, the, best, the best choice. Okay. All right, I'm going to conclude with just an example, and I'd like for you to um, work this one um, separately on your own. Um, uh, your company produces teen-oriented apparel. A graphic artist has an idea for a character. Let's say it's a funny guy with pointy hair who shrugs. Um, I don't know where I came up with that. And wants to try it out on some clothing articles. You have three choices for how to roll it out. Um, on just a single t-shirt, call that choice A on a t-shirt and a sweatshirt, call it choice B, or on an entire product line, um, call that choice C. And if, if the market likes the character, then you have those payoffs there. Uh, if the response is fair, then you have a different set of payoffs. And if the market doesn't like the character, then the payoffs are, you, you can see you actually have negative payoffs here. Okay, so that would be, you know, losses that result from, you know, investing in inventory that doesn't get sold, okay? So in addition to this, I give you some probabilities here. So the probability that they'll like the character is 0.35. The probability that there will be a fair response is 0.35. And the probability that they will not like the character, so that is you know, bad payoff, um, is 0 0.30, okay? And those add up to one, so they're mutually exclusive and collectively exhausted. And the question is, what is the best choice? Back up your decision with reference to MaxiMax, MaxiMin, EMV, and EOL. Okay, so why don't you give that problem a try and let me know if you have any questions.